Hey everyone, thanks for joining us today. My name is Karen Humphrey and I'm a BU Consultant with Early Childhood Australia. With me today is Margaret Nixon, a BU Consultant from Headspace, Narelle Corliss, Headspace Schools and Communities Program Manager, and all of us have worked extensively with disaster impacted learning communities. And joining us today from a disaster impacted learning community is Kerry Harton. She's from Lobethal Community Kindergarten in South Australia. So just to let you know, this session is appropriate for all educators and we are going to explore some learnings from disaster impacted communities and how we can translate these into practical strategies that all educators can be implementing to take agency towards resilience within their communities. Before I go any further though, I'd like to acknowledge that I am meeting, we are meeting, on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and we pay our respects to Elders past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge that this land was never ceded and always was and always will be Aboriginal land. We are aware that we have people joining us from all over the country, so if you'd like to put your acknowledgement from the lands that you are on in the chat, we'd love to see them. Uh, in today's session, we aim to provide a safe space to discuss information around personal wellbeing. And as part of making our vis visual space safe, please consider confidentiality and privacy throughout the session when using the chat box. We'd really love to hear you throughout the session, so please feel free to participate through the chat and any polls uh, that are made available to you. We'd also like to acknowledge that each of us comes to this session potentially juggling many different things and that we are all busy. So we just wanna thank you for making time for joining the session. Um, and taking this time to learn about how we can take learnings from disaster communities and use those within our other education settings. We hope that you will, along the way, feel empowered to try some new strategies and also highlight the strategies that, you're, that already work for you. The learning objectives for today we're hoping that it brings an understanding of how educators can take agency towards increasing the resilience of their learning community. We're looking at translating experiences from disaster impacted communities into everyday practical strategies. And we're also wanting to learn how fostering positive relationships within your community and with external supports can build resilience. So first off, I'm going to throw to Narelle. Thank you for being here today. You've been managing the Response and Recovery Program in the Northern New South Wales area since uh, 2020. As most people know, this region was devastated by numerous flooding events. And I'm just wondering if you can give us a bit of a picture around what you're seeing now within those communities. Thanks, Margaret. Um, I think the Northern New South Wales area have experienced probably very similar things to other communities that have also been impacted by different natural disasters. It's a complex and very challenging um, environment to be in. There's a lot of grief and loss. There's a lot of trauma, uh, anxiety, uh, and there's also disruption to services and um, access to learning communities, businesses, food security, and a whole range of other things. We found that a lot of supporters, including um, educators, uh, were needing support themselves. So they were in dual roles of what they were doing across community. And we know that everyone wears multiple hats in community. So whether you're a sports coach or a volunteer or a service provider of some kind, you are impacted on multiple levels when you're in a natural disaster community. We've just passed the 12 month first anniversary, which um, you know is a bit of a milestone. And we found that most people and most of the communities have returned to routine of some kind. However, we do know that there's quite a few people that have had to leave the area. There's been a disruption to relationships and um, connection. Uh, and so the impacts vary from person to person as well as community to community and recovery will be a long-term process. Mm. And you touched on there about the complexity and the individual nature of recovery. Um, the National Principles for Disaster Recovery developed by ADA recognise that each, re each region has their own distinct challenges and complexities. Um, and that's why this community, the notion of community-led recovery is so important. Um, the principles state that this recovery needs to be well coordinated and that informa information channels are open and consistent. Um, it also recognises the importance of building capacity within a local community 
And considering these principles, I'm wondering if you can share uh, with us how your program has worked alongside communities. We've been really privileged to be able to work alongside communities and with communities and for communities. Mm -hmm. uh, each community is unique and it has its own history, its own identity, uh, its own complexity, but also its own strengths. And so our role has been really to listen and learn and understand each community and work with them and other partner organisations to be able to um, support them in a community-led initiatives that will support their recovery and and also based on evidence so and, and other experiences in other communities. So uh, we've done a few things actually and um, they include developing a recovery action plan which we've used with school leaders across uh, all education sectors in the northern New South Wales area and it's a it's a beautiful document where they can focus on staff, they can focus on families, students and uh, school leaders because they've had to lead in a really disruptive time and then pick one or two key things they want to achieve each term and they will be fitting into categories that align with the disaster recovery principles of care and concern so you know who are your local support services and how do you um, make referral pathways to to those services uh, about communication so what can you put in your newsletters how can you communicate more broadly with your community about um, other other things that are about recovery uh, and a whole other list of strategies. But we also were able to bring up some disaster recovery experts into the northern New South Wales communities across the seven impacted local government areas. And they were able to have community forums where people were able to connect together, understand what trauma and natural disaster recovery looks like and different coping. So it's been uh, multifaceted and partnered with lots of different organisations. Yeah. Can I just add Thank something you. in there? Sorry, I just yeah. want to touch on the point that you said pick one or two things. Kerry and I had a quite a robust conversation earlier about how much information can be given oh, to you when you're, when you're disaster impacted and it's great to get all of the information but you're overwhelmed yourself and it's really hard to know where to start. So I think the picking one or two things Well it's empowering, sense. sense of agency yeah. and it's actually achievable. And mm. what makes sense for you at that time right now Correct. right here? And it will be different for every school or learning community. That's mm. right. I agree. And I think that's where it's really important for those that are part of that community to really take out what is vital for them at that, at that point as Great. well. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to go on and just have a bit of a, a look and a think about the uh, BU Bushfire Response Program, which supported learning communities after the 2020 fires. Um, what came out of that were three themes that really came through strongly. And I think that you have touched on these, which is uh, just amazing to see how it, um, through different disasters, we have similar themes that can come out. So one was understanding trauma-aware principles and strategies, looking at how we can provide support for children and young people who are really struggling, and then that very key one about educator wellbeing, and you have touched on, and I think we're going to hear a bit further, mm. a bit more later on, around um, the, how many different hats an educator and leaders can be holding as they're also trying to be providing education and, and bringing our young people back together within the school. Um, staff were not only trying to manage their own trauma reaction from their students, but you know, as we said, they're wearing the hats and they're often impacted themselves. Many of the school leaders within uh, who were involved in this program were quick to, quick to recognise the need to support their staff and to encourage connection. And this could be through things as simple as morning teas and coffees being brought in, but they also recognised in that practical way of wanting to reduce the workload so that uh, staff were asked really to fulfil the essentials, um, as well as making sure that we call on those support networks that we have, such as EAP. Um, many of the schools adapted quickly to the needs of their students and then we had the complication of COVID coming in, <laughs> which really interrupted all that we knew previously around recovery after natural disasters because we couldn't do that close connectedness. It was very difficult to get back to those routines that we know are so important. Um, 
But the schools prioritised when they could the returning back to work and that when they could bring students in, then they were looking at what can we build in that was fun? What are some of those routines that we can get back to? Looking at how they can encourage kids to make sense of the experiences they've had through using activities such as um, visual arts or writing, but also making sure that there were those really intentional social, social and emotional wellbeing programs that helped build those skills that were so important, such as self-regulation. Um, all of that is a very long preamble into <laughs> before, looking... Before we go any further, sorry, I just want to touch on the fact that you said um, managing trauma reactions of their students. We also have to manage the trauma reactions of the educators within Correct. that as well, because yep. I know from talking and working with Kerry that they were heavily impacted by the bushfires 2019 in the Adelaide Hills, not 2020. Mm. Um, and Kerry was evacuated from her own, own home and didn't know mm. if she was going to going to come back to her home. So we're managing that for mm. the children in our care, the children that we're supporting with their development and learning, but all, we're also trying to work that out for ourselves as well. And a lot of these educators are living and working within these disaster areas as well. Mm. I think that is one of the characteristics around community trauma. Yep. It's where the whole community is overwhelmed, all the systems that support our communities. It's the footy clubs, it's the headspace centre, it's the local oval, it's the church, it's the library. All of those connections as well as our schools and our hubs that are overwhelmed. So everyone is trying to keep rebuilding the boat while they're still sitting in it or building the plane, whatever that analogy is, um, which does take time, which is where learnings from other communities have gone that have gone through it can then also help and affirm and say, hey, you're not alone. They mm. have got over it or that got over it is not a good term to use. They have honest. made sense of mm. it. There has been um, a moving on with this experience within their life and their history. Um, so with that, I'm going to throw to um, a video which will just show you a little bit of um, the BU program. The Educators Framework for Supporting Resilience and Recovery is designed to help educators support children in the event of a natural disaster or community trauma. It includes strategies which can be useful in preparing for the event or in the immediate, short-term or long-term aftermath. The framework is made up of four parts. Educator well-being, daily approaches, monitoring progress, and activating support. Let's start with educator well-being. Educator well-being is based on the idea that to best support children, you need to take care of your own physical and mental health. This part of the framework is built around the three pillars of well-being, self-awareness, self-care and supports. Daily Approaches looks at how everyday routines and relationships play a powerful role in supporting children's regulation and recovery following a traumatic event Monitoring Progress recognises that, as an educator, you are in a unique position to observe children's recovery over time and to identify those children who may need extra support. This part introduces the BU Mental Health Continuum and Beatles Observation Tool, which can assist you in gathering information and documenting observations about a child's behaviour. Activating support involves working together with your colleagues, the child, their parents and their support networks to establish next steps for recovery. This is an ongoing process and may involve sharing information with the family, providing tools and tips or connecting them with specialist support services. At the centre of the framework is the child, whose social and emotional well-being and ability to learn and engage is supported by these four domains. Much of what you are already doing in your day-to-day -day role will naturally help children following a disaster or community trauma. 
This framework is designed as a guide to help enhance your existing skills as an educator in supporting their resilience and recovery. I hope you enjoyed that little video and it leads me into a last question for Narelle. I, I do like in the video where they say though what you are already doing is supporting your children. It's really important. I always come from a strength-based perspective, mm -hmm. so it's really important to acknowledge that. So I, I would just like to touch on the fact that learning communities are often seen as the hub of a community mm -hmm. and especially in regional towns and we'll mm -hmm. touch on that later, Kerry. So, do you have any examples of how some of the schools that you've worked with have promoted recovery and built their resilience? Yeah, it's been a real privilege to work with the um, learning communities in northern New South Wales. And, you know, m as we've said, there have been multiple cascading traumas in some of these communities. So they've been managing a lot and coming back to keep doing what you're already doing so well. Mm -hmm. Don't drop that off your radar. But adding to that, they have um, the, the Northern New South Wales communities have been doing things like going back to essential business to um, reprioritise that, have been creating space um, to have connection and, and some fun um, for young children, young people to come back to school. Um, and they've also had time release for staff to be able to attend to their own personal needs like insurance claims and medical appointments and other life kind of things that are happening. So um, there's been a lot of flexibility and acknowledgement that there are multiple needs for people within their learning communities. Um, there's, a, there's some fantastic examples, one uh, of a primary school who utilised their parent body to uh, who were musicians. So it was a local community with some fantastic musicians and they came in and, and worked with the children in the primary school to, uh, to give their voice to their experience. And then they, they created songs, which were then put into a songbook and then it was performed for the community. And so the children's voice was represented, but it also was a nice healing space for them and a connection with the broader community. Um, there was a secondary school who, who interviewed uh, and worked with community members and, and put their stories into a drama, which was then also performed back mm. to the community. So that creative art space has been a really well utilised um, vehicle for some of the, the trauma uh, recovery process and also connecting with that, that the richer, broader community that surround, um, surround schools. Uh, so with, with the flooding, for example, um, you know, Mother Nature took on a, a bit of a, a role in people's lives that wasn't very positive for many of them. And so some schools have had to really um, reconnect with their natural environment to actually mm. cre remember what a beautiful natural context they live in. And so some schools have had maths lessons, for example, down on the riverbank or some social sort of lunchtime barbecues to be able to reconnect with Mother Nature, which mm. is why families are living there in the first mm. place often. Um, but one of my favourite uh, e events was a school who had been unable to return to site for about 28 weeks and they'd been co-located with another school, mm. which has its own complexities. And when they were given the green light to come back onto school, the school leadership team recognised that there needed to be a reconnection mm. for everybody and reconnection to their community because it had been a, quite an extensive period of time. So we worked with them to bring in their local music teachers, their artists, their um, sports, uh, so sort of, uh, dance, and we had food, uh, mm. and we had grandparents, and we had pets, and we had, you know, the local community members come in, and it was a day not of joy but a day of connection. And people shared stories, they shared supports, they got to see their kids having a really nice time and, and enjoying some life and a bit of levity mm. after a period of um, of time that had been quite complex. Mm. So there's so many wonderful examples um, and I think if you're interested get in touch with some of your local learning communities and 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 hear their stories because mm. they're really willing to share and, and pay it forward. Mm. Thank you. Now we're going to move on and hear from Kerry. I'm hoping I'm not going to steal some of your thunder <laughs> but hoping but when we talked this morning when we were preparing for this one of the things that you talked about was getting back to what felt normal and getting back to those connections. So I'm just extending a little bit on what um, Narelle has said. You had to leave your, your home, you had to leave your community and you didn't know what you were coming back to. But the thing that your son did was packed his cricket gear so that when you came back, you went straight to cricket so he could play his game. Just for some normal life. Yeah. Mm. And we gave him the choice at the time and said, do you want to or do you just want to be at home? And he said, no, I want to play. Okay, let's just get on. Yeah. Let's just move yeah. on and keep things somewhat normal for our yeah. children. Yeah. So 
And yeah, that, it was important for him. That wasn't one of our questions, so I'm sorry. <laughs> I, seg I segued all by myself as I often do. <laughs> okay, so now I am going to ask you one of the questions. So we know that strong partnerships will support you through recovery. They will pos positively impact a child's resilience and empower your immediate and extended community. Can, to, can you talk to us about how you have strengthened partnerships within your service and the broader community in order to implement a whole community approach to supporting resilience and recovery? Look, I think it's one of the very first things is that when a whole community and you're part of that community, it's really tricky to know where to start. Um, we were in the, we were in holidays for us. So we're a Department for Education site. So we run on the same terms as um, school. So we're a kindergarten. And for us, we'd farewelled our group of children. They were moving off to school. And we had, well, while we started to get to know our new group, we didn't really know them yet. So we had this group of families that didn't have a sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. They had no normal yet. They didn't know what normal at school was gonna look like. We then had another group of um, children that were gonna be coming to us that were in between as well. They, they were in limbo. Um, they didn't know what normal was yet mm -hmm. at kindy. So, you know, our, our approach initially was to try and contact both and sort of see where everyone was sitting, how they were feeling and, um, and trying to just make a connection with them. Um, I think like, that idea of, of not really knowing where to start was really quite tricky and it really did come down to a whole community approach. Mm. It wasn't just us and it, it wasn't left to us. I think that was what was amazing. Um, you know, you feel privileged mm -hmm. to have worked with these communities. We feel really lucky mm -hmm. to have had all these organisations and people come to support us as well. So, you know, we are getting people come in like backpacks for kids and mm -hmm. our director at the time was incredible. She liaised and worked with them and handed out backpacks for hundreds mm -hmm. of children mm -hmm. in, our, in our district. Um, we had, um, she was working with uh, DHS and um, Playgroup SA to set up a, a creche. We had, I was, I, I'm really proud of all of our staff because while they were also locals mm. and community affected, we had staff working in our local recovery centre. So she was um, volunteering in there, uh, getting first-hand experience, like first-hand stories. Mm. Um, sometimes the first point of contact mm. outside of the um, fires people had first time they left their home they came to the recovery center so she was hearing those sorts of things um, we had staff working um, in, in their holidays uh, setting up the creche we were uh, working in there we wanted to be that familiar face so that our families had had something to, to connect with I think what we feel really lucky about is actually the fact that we we kind of, I guess, became that middle ground where we had all these agencies trying to help us and we were then able to put it back into our, our local community. So um, having that support meant that it be, could become a whole community approach as well. Um, in terms of end of holidays, knowing that we needed to get back to kindy, um, and we needed to somehow make this okay for everybody. Um, it was all about really setting up those routines, setting up, um, you know, making sure that everyone knew exactly how the day was going to go, making sure that um, it was planned and parents knew mm -hmm. and children knew exactly when mum and dad were coming back or well whoever's picking them up. And well communicated. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, we from all the information we were given, we knew that connection was really important. Yeah. So within our site, we'd set up a, a wellbeing space. We mm. purchased a coffee machine. Mm -hmm. um, Food is such mm. a <sighs> healing, drawing together, Isn't connecting mm. yes. thing to participate in. And it, and it helps people, I think, to just sit down and kind of go, Make a ah, yeah. it, you know, yeah. okay. Yeah. Or to have someone else there to be able to, talk to yeah. and, and bounce off of. And these are the times, Sorry. Kerry, when you said people were coming in that didn't feel that they had been affected mm. because mm. they still had their home mm. and they hadn't lost 
lost anything but mm. that's when the tears would start and you'd say well I didn't realize I was affected mm. but maybe I am yeah yeah exactly that validating mm. yeah Yes, exactly. And so, you know, this space that we created just provided that opportunity. And we had a lot of parents who weren't quite ready to leave their children. Yeah. Mm. So it meant that they could sit, mm. they could be, mm. they could feel comfortable. They maybe have someone to talk to, um, but they weren't far from their children because mm. some people really struggled with that. Um, we also um, had a, other pro um, things going on. We actually lost a sibling of one of our children. So we really realised that we had layered trauma within yeah. our community as well. So not only was that another grieving point for our, our, our area, um, but it meant that, again, our whole community could come mm. together mm. as well and connect. And that was really, really important to the recovery process. Layered trauma is an interesting thing to unpack, mm. isn't it? Mm. No time for that now. <laughs> <laughs> Next one. <laughs> okay, so we, we've had a look at that framework for supporting resilience. That was the little video we watched. Um, so one of the parts of that is our daily approaches. So can you talk with us about your everyday routines and relationships? And you've touched about on this quite a bit already. Um, have, have played a big role in supporting children and families since those bushfires. Look, I think... As we entered our, our term, one of the main things that we really wanted or that we talked about as a staff team was we wanted to be that welcoming face. We wanted to have a familiar space, a fun place, a place that was really comfortable for not only our children but our, our families as well. So that was, I guess, our approach to that beginning of term. Um, so that was not only sort of, I guess, our approach, but that was our routine. Every day we wanted it to be, well, mm. the days that they attended, we wanted it to be the same. We wanted them to come in mm. and feel comfortable. Mm. So building that sense of belonging was probably really, really high priority early on. And safety. Mm. And safe. Yeah. It needed to be a safe place. Yeah. And again, that was not only for children, yeah. Yeah. that was for parents to feel that their children were safe. Yeah. And staff. Yeah. Yeah. We're not You're throwing right. any curveballs mm. at you. Mm. We are going to keep it consistent mm. and safe so that everyone knows what will be happening mm. at each yes. given time. Yes, mm. and, that, and that was really important. And that wasn't just important for term one. That's actually been important yeah. for, for more than yeah. f multiple years yeah. yes. to, to keep that there as well. I think the other thing that was really important for us was staffing. We knew that parents would potentially need someone to talk to. We knew that children would need someone to talk to. So we made sure that we had extra people around um, so that every moment they could come to somebody if they needed to. So we knew that at the beginning of the day, we needed more than one person on farewell and, uh, well, sorry, welcoming, and then at the end of the day, farewelling as well, mm -hmm. just to support those families. Um, you know, we had to do a lot of handholding. We had to support them through reading of notes, Get, getting the information like it wasn't as simple as just here's your note mm. there had to be multiple processes that we had to go through to support mm. that um, getting back into into those days as well and we did hold transition meetings at the beginning of the year which really was a, a beautiful opportunity for us to connect with families build some relationships and find out that most people were fire affected mm -hmm. they they didn't think they were mm -hmm. but once they started talking and once they started sharing the impact of of their moments mm -hmm. or even the return like if they evacuated when they returned there was there was yeah a lot of a lot I of think, things that they I needed think you're to do. describing an opportunity to create uh, you're creating an opportunity for people to be able to share their experience and validate that they have been affected because it, i hear all the time that person's worse than me mm -hmm. um, and so they, yes. they hold back or delay what they need to do because yeah. they don't think that they're as bad as someone mm -hmm. else so mm -hmm. creating that space and to important. be honest with you I think staff did that for a lot longer yeah because yeah. I think we had to play a different role yeah. at I, that point yeah. and that's sort of something I've seen played out in schools where teachers will say well we weren't here yeah. when the disaster hit so I don't feel like I can go to my normal support people yeah. within the school because they're still coping with a whole lot of things I feel bad about taking their time you know it, yeah. it does impact mm. for a long yeah. time that's one of the things around recovery mm. it takes whatever time it takes yeah. for each individual 
Yep. And it does come out at different times. Mm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. It, it's not linear, the journey of recovery. No, no, it's not. And it's not cyclical anymore. No. We don't have this little cycle <laughs> no, anymore. No, no. no. Mm. And so, mm. Can I ask then, have your daily approaches changed and how have they changed as a result of the impact of the bushfires? I think we've we've done a lot of reflecting over the last three and a bit years. Um, yes, we've learned a lot. Uh, I think communication is one of those really big mm -hmm. learning experiences for us. Um, and also just how vital relationships are. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think initially the parents need to, to gain some control. You know, we were trying, we were probably overshared early mm -hmm. on. Um, we, because we had parents really needing to know exactly what their children were doing every step of the day. So we would try really hard to do that. And it, it was really challenging for us. It was exhausting. Mm. And, you know, I know our well-being probably wasn't overly well looked after at that, that point. Do you think that was actually something that really aided the recovery of your families? Um, yes, I, yes, I do. I, I think it probably helped meet that need at that moment. Um, I think the other thing that's really just important mm. to note on that was that we often knew that there was points where people were frustrated mm -hmm. and that would often come to us. Yep. Uh, so we You're quite often... Constant. You're a constant. Yeah. And so we would often find that we had to step back mm. and take a breath ourselves. Um, mm. And we knew that, you know, all we had to do was respond with calm and kindness. So that became a little bit of an approach for us as well. And to learn to be kind to yourselves, which you've admitted was probably one of the last things that you thought yeah. about. Mm. It really was, but it was really important. Mm. And we, I think as a staff team, that was something that we had to really remind each other of. Yeah. And we were lucky enough to, to, have, to have that. Um, there's things I think in our program that have changed as well. The importance of just sitting down and talking and listening and taking as much time as that needs. You know, we don't need to move on to this and this and this. If we're having a conversation and we're sharing that with our children, then it's really important mm. and it's valued by our children. We have group times that go for a really long time because our children, they want to be heard. Mm. They have something to say and they want to be heard. And mm. it started from the fires. And that mm. to me is what a group time about is about. Mm. It's child led. It's not because we need to transition into something else yep. as educators. Mm. It's about the children want to be here with us mm. and have that connection. Mm. Yeah, mm. and they want, to, they want to share those things. Mm. So there's definitely been changes that we've, we've made around. Um, and, and they've sort of just evolved as well. But yeah, mm. thank you. Okay, I'm still asking you questions. <laughs> okay. so you're doing really well. So, as a way to support children's resilience after the bushfires, you implemented a number of practical strategies, and I know a lot about these, being your BU consultant. Mm -hmm. So that's great. So it was to support children's understanding of what had happened, and to also increase their sense of agency, something that we value in early childhood so much. Uh, can you talk us through a couple of examples of what you included in your program and practice as a result? And I know that you still include. There, this is probably one of those ones that I could take a lot longer than we have. <laughs> have you seen um, the time? <laughs> I have. Especially if we give people as much time as they need to say that they need to say. I'll try. <laughs> I'll try. Look, in the beginning, I think there's been things that we did early on, things that we did a little bit further down the track and things that we do now that, that still impact that. Um, early on, we actually have this really big book of learn, like it, So it's a big book um, blank. Children draw in it. We sit down with them and they can come and go as they please and they just draw. So early on, this almost became that real art therapy mm -hmm. where they sat, they drew. We have pages that are just covered in black. Mm -hmm. um, we have pages that have red and black mm -hmm. and, you know, not a Can not I much ask else. what they used to make the black quiz? Uh, we did use some charcoal early on as well and we used that in a, in a variety of ways. Um, but then we also just had their pencils and for mm. some it was just a mm. I just need to get my frustration out mm. as well um, but for a lot of them it was that opportunity they they talked about losing their house while mm. they sat there and drew mm. they talked about where their families went when they evacuated they talked about what what happened on the day of the fires what happened when they came back what they saw what was what was important to them what the like 
our country fire service did mm. what yeah so it was really you know it was beautiful from our point of view being able to be part of that mm. and to hear that um and to be open and just to listen again i think we learned a lot through that process of just listening mm -hmm. asking respectful questions children did want to talk about it they wanted to share their experiences because sometimes their experiences were not as important at home mm. than maybe it was for them. You know, we had a little girl who actually had her umbrella burnt in the fire because it was being used to protect some plants because of the hot weather. But that was probably very minimal in the big scheme of things at home. But for her, yeah, exactly it was right. really, really important. And yeah. she needed the opportunity to express yeah. that. And doing it that way was mm. really important. Mm. Um, some other things were, we, we did use charcoal. We, we collected charcoal, children bought it from home. Children covered themselves in it. They, they immersed themselves in it. They explored it, they looked at it, they talked about it, they, where did it come from? Mm. Um, they drew with it. It was, it was just another step of, of what had happened and what they were seeing because everything was black. Can, we, can I extend you a little bit and talk a little bit about your bush kinder and how yes. that is, has been such a valuable part of your program and practice and how the regrowth within the bush kinder has supported recovery? Look, I think the first thing we had to address with returning to our bush kinder program, it, we had to hold because it was burnt. Um, and they had to make it safe before we were able to get back out there again. So, you know, our families were very appreciative because they didn't want to have to grieve the loss of something else. Um, getting back out there was amazing. We, as a staff team, went out there first. Again, we needed to address our well-being and how we were going to manage that, how we were going to move forward this year because there's nothing there. Like, mm. So we went out there and while it was confronting there was also this real sense of hope and taking our children out there was it, you, you know we got the opportunity to walk and talk with them to listen to them again to hear their stories again for them to keep talking about it but our program for that year really took this opportunity for for growth and hope and revitalizing you know and looking at it from that point of view and I think that was not only our children our parents could see that as well so it was a really beautiful process that we were able to go through through returning um, to our bush kindy and again our families wanted it mm. they really really were desperate for us to be out there again because they didn't want their children to miss out on that mm. so it was important and that's Amazing. almost getting back to that new normal, isn't it? Mm. The new normal. Yes. Then, yes. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, our children were covered. <laughs> <laughs> Everything was black. From the, you know, they went home completely covered. Well, we always but say in early childhood, don't send your children in good clothes. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. We've had to get some new jackets because of it. But, you know, it, it's been worthwhile. It, it's been a huge part of that um, mm. that, that growth and, and moving on and recovery mm. process as mm. well. So, and you know, there's things that we are doing now that still we connect with our community. We get mm. our children back out in different ways. We've set up a, a community garden and we've had a, a mural painted um, by an Aboriginal artist that depicts our connection to Bush Kindy and that sits next to our community garden. So it, it all is part of being able to connect with our community mm. and bring our community together as well. Awesome, thank you. Mm. Um, I just have one sort of final question just and we have touched around you know this sort of cascading disasters and disaster you know we have these um, stages and that sometimes in the last few years we've never really finished one sort of full stop before we're starting again but um, I know with your community with the fire season that we've just had um, I'm wondering how you looked at that notion of preparedness that we might, you know, traditionally put as, you know, that sort of first stage, um, how you approach that and how you manage that with your children, both sort of in what you, uh, the practical actions, but also emotionally supporting them. Look, I think one of the very first things, again, our, that was not only our children that were having to face 
that next step. Mm. Um, our families were already doing that. Um, our local country fire service um, were promoting and pushing people to have bushfire action plans. Uh, they were talking about it. I think it's made, I think probably taken away a bit of the complacency mm. um, that may have been there in the past. People are making bushfire action plans. They know what mm. they want. They're preparing. Um, and with that, our children are, are coming and they talk about it, mm. so, which, which is great. They have the opportunity to hear that at home and, and then share that with us. And, and we want them to share that with us. And be actively engaged. Exactly. Mm. You know, our, we have evacuation and evacuation practices and they're perfect opportunities for our children to share mm. and to tell us, well, we do this or we do that. And it's like, well, great. What do you do? What do you do? And it just, it opens that and others who might go, I don't know, let's go home, ask mm. mum and dad, see what you do for that. Mm. So, you know, again, it's it, very conversational, um, opportunities to just talk and to listen as well. We also make sure that we bring in our emergency services for our children to become familiar mm -hmm. with, so that a police officer, an ambulance officer, a CFS for us, um, what they look like. Mm. So they know that they're part of our community, they're part of what helped us and what will help us as well. And it's also an opportunity to arm our children with knowledge mm. um, so that they know what to do if, if there's things left for them. Mm. And I think that's really, really important mm. for them. We have, you know, planes, we have the bomber planes that generally mm. will often fly over, the helicopters. Uh, it gives an opportunity again to sit there and have those incidents, incidental conversations about you know, what it means mm. and what do you know about it mm. and what are they for? Mm. So, you know, while initially they were probably triggers, mm. now it's become more about well, what, do, what is that? Mm. So it's still things that have moved on mm. and, and talk and about those it. incidental conversations become your intentional teaching moments. Yes. Mm. So I think that's really important to acknowledge because mm. those incidental conversations that happened throughout 2020 after the fires have become your intentional teaching yeah. for the next three years. Yes, mm. so exactly. I want to acknowledge that on your behalf. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I think the, like, just on that as well, we have a little campfire at our bush kindy and, mm. you know, that is part of our children learning about good fires and bad fires, mm. um, knowing that there's purpose to fires, knowing that, you know, there is good that can come from these things. It's not all scary. And while it can be a trigger for some parents initially, they can work through that process as well by being with their children. So mm. there's quite a few things, but um, they're probably the main the main ones that we do. Mm. Thank you. Oh, it looks like we've got whoa, not long to go. We've got a couple of questions that have come through that we might just touch on now. Sure. Um, I'm going to have a look at the first one, Kerry, on your behalf. I'll read it out. And if you feel like you've got some words to answer that, mm -hmm. that'd be great. So has connection with community changed forever post-disaster or do you anticipate a point when life returns to normal? Thanks for that question, Sarah. I think this is really tricky because we had layer upon layer of trauma because we obviously have our bushfires. We lost baby Dot and then we had COVID. Mm. So it's really hard to know for us what is post-disaster, what is yep. post-COVID. Yep. It, it's, it, I think there is a normal that we're mm. going to return to, but I think it will be a little bit of a, a new normal, mm. um, especially within our learning environment. There's certainly things that we've learned along the way and we've adapted to and we've changed that mm. I really do think that will stay like that because it's changed for the better. Yep. It's made a difference. And I think that's a stream that we've heard from mm. both of you mm. is that the school is in the community and the community is in the school mm. and that those connections, while we, it might be something like um, a, a disaster that kind of makes us focus on that connectedness, it is something that's there forever. And our kids that are in the school are also outside in the community. And those people in the communities are coming into our school, whether it's at the fate, whether it's as musicians, um, you it know, deep, whether they're doing it. it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so if anything, it's that richness that mm -hmm. it does really highlight about how schools, communities, connectedness 
is part of preparedness if you even wanted to go back to whether we have a stage of being able to prepare. Mm -hmm. I'm conscious of time and I apologise that we can't answer any more of the questions but something for you to reflect on Kerry, there was a question from Judith, have the stories been recorded in any way for the community? Um, Short answer. Short answer. Uh, <laughs> there has been done through some of our local community. So um, the Adelaide Hills Council have um, pulled together some bits and pieces. I'm not exactly sure if it's been recorded to go out further. Um, to but okay. yeah, I agree. I think that's going to be really important for, for others who have mm, got, been through it as well. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. So what an amazing panel to have sat on. Um, but we would also encourage all of you to continue to be engaged with BU and to keep up to date. If anything around what we've um, learned today is that this whole school notion of uh, mental health and wellbeing creates a beautiful safety net that can support your school community. Or early learning. Or your school community, meaning <laughs> early learning, meaning secondary schools. Um, where, I had to do it. Yeah. <laughs> where you can um, use that as a safety net for uh, whatever your school faces. And, you know, we have these um, challenges that um, many schools have been through in the last three years. Having that, uh, having that um, school-wide um, program, which is really going to help support your students, support your staff, but also build that connectedness with parents, which is then leading on to the mm. community. So I would just, um, you know, encourage you to keep in touch with what, with what is happening with BU. Reach out to your BU consultant. You've got one of us sitting there just <laughs> waiting for a call. Um, <laughs> Uh, but also make sure that you look at the resources, visit bu.edu.au, keep in touch on all the socials. Thank you. All right, so on behalf of myself and my panel members, I've really enjoyed these 45 minutes. It's gone so fast. Really I'd like fast. to say thank you for attending and we hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>